Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm hoping you can hear me and see me. My name is Sasha Powell, and it's my job to welcome you this morning to the latest in our series of webinars. Today's webinar is a celebration of blocks, and um, it's also the launch of the latest in our Froebel Approaches to Education pamphlet series, uh, Froebel's Gifts and Block Play Today by Jane Winnett, um, who is a trustee of the Froebel Trust, and she's also the chair of our education subcommittee. Morning, Jane. Good morning. Um, and she was until last week, uh, or indeed perhaps still this week, um, the head teacher of two nursery schools. So she is a very busy woman, as well as being a tutor for um, the Edinburgh Froebel course. So um, we're delighted to welcome Jane to join us this morning to lead today's webinar. Thank you very much for uh, organising and hosting this webinar, Jane. Um, we're also delighted to welcome all of you, our guests, um, to, to the webinar today. Um, we had 480 registrations for the webinar, which is absolutely phenomenal, and it's a record breaker for us uh, this year, so thank you for being here. Um, the webinar will last 90 minutes. Um, and there will be a Q&A section at the end. Um, many of you have already discovered the chat and it's lovely to see your greetings popping up on there. Please do continue to use the chat throughout the webinar. You can make comments and you can ask questions of Jane and um, the guests she'll be talking with this morning and who'll be presenting uh, today. Um, the Q&A section will be starting at around 11.15. Um, we are recording the webinar. We can't see you, but obviously we can see your comments in the chat. Um, and the, the recording will be broadcast, we hope, in the next 48 hours on the Froebel Trust website. So it will be widely available. And we appreciate that some colleagues haven't been able to join us today. Um, at the very end of the poll, We'll have a short poll which uh, should pop up it has four questions and we'd be so grateful if you could take just 10 seconds to um, tick the answers that apply to you it just helps us to understand a little bit more about uh, who you are and uh, what you think of our webinars and so forth right i am going to hand over immediately to jane who will introduce the webinar and our other speakers today thanks jane well, thank you sasha it's a real pleasure to be here um, and we're here to celebrate blocks, blocks of all different sizes, um, blocks of all different shapes, and blocks whose ancestors was um, in the Frobel gifts, particularly this um, block, which was from gift four. So I'm really delighted to be here today and um, have so many people um, here. So we have... Um, I have some people here at my table with me today, so we're going to have a round table discussion. All the guests have sat at this table on previous occasions, um, and I'd just like to introduce them. So first of all, we have um, Jane Reid, um, who is, uh, will be well known to many of you from um, her uh, many writings and also her uh, day ones for the Froebel course um, in Edinburgh. So good morning, Jean. Um, we also have um, Katrina Gill, who's one of my fellow um, Frobelians in the Edinburgh Froebel Network, who um, has uh, recently been uh, writing for uh, Education Scotland, uh, developing a resource on uh, block play. So good morning, Katrina. And uh, finally, um, we have um, Tina Bruce, who uh, um, was originally my uh, tutor and external examiner um, and who has been a great friend and mentor to me over the years. So uh, good morning, Tina. So um, and of course, good morning to all of you, all um, however many there are of you. Um, it seems like a very large number for quite a small room in my house. However, you are all extremely welcome. So you can see there the cover of the um, the uh, pamphlet, which um, you know I have to say I'm absolutely delighted with the way that it's turned out. Um, you know, it's taken a long process to get to this uh, point where uh, we have something to share today. So um, each part of this um, is a journey. So. Um, we started off probably, well, I started off with the drafting of the um, text 
and um, working through that and then finding, you know, how do I bring this um, pamphlet to life? How is it going to be of use to people who are in uh, practice, um, who perhaps want to develop their own um, block play? But also, um, how do we look back at Froebel's gifts and look at the relevance of those um, for the history of uh, block play, but also for the relevance today? So the title has to reflect that um, the sort of ancestors of today's uh, blocks, and that's why it's called Froebel's Gifts and Block Play Today. So there was only ever one photograph that I wanted for the cover, and it's this one. Um, and it's a child using uh, one of uh, Froebel's uh, gifts from the small uh, blocks. But it really captured for me um, that imagination and wonder, um, which I think is um, one of the real uh, joys of block play. So every time you play with the blocks, you create something different. Um, and you, do, sometimes, you don't always know what you're going to make before you start off. So that's the wonderful thing about blocks. They're so open-ended um, and they can be, um, you know, they can be put together in so many uh, different ways, an infinite number of ways. Um, and what you create at the end will probably be something that um, inspires your um, imagination, um, you know, stimulates your curiosity and uh, develops your uh, creativity. Now, as I say, I was always struck, I always wanted this photograph, but there was a little problem with this photograph. Um, and part of the problem was that it wasn't long enough or tall enough. So in the design process that had to be um, lengthened. So we had to have an extra piece of curtain and an extra piece of table added on. It's amazing what people can do now um, to, uh, you know, to bring all these things to um, fruition. So the pamphlet is, it doesn't reflect any one curriculum, so uh, it could be used in whichever country or um, wherever you are. Um, and it falls into several headings, and that was really helpful for me as a structure when I was writing it. So I found the headings first, and then I worked um, through the you know, paragraphs. And the text has to be quite tight, as you'll see, because it has to fit into certain uh, boxes. Uh, uh, and, you know, the whole structure of it um, has to fit into columns um, and the uh, photographs have to match up. So the, the whole process of designing it is really uh, fascinating. So it starts with the history of the gifts and, um, and then it moves on to blocks uh, today and the sort of learning that, uh, that blocks support uh, for children. Um, and then I would say it moves on to more um, observing, supporting and extending. So um, really how we work in alongside children uh, to support um, block play de and development. And then finally, at the end of the pamphlet, there's um, a link to resources and books and uh, where you might buy um, blocks or the gifts and occupations. So that's kind of the st structure. Um, one thing I, I had writ, I'd written um, quite a bit of the text and felt, um, you know, that it didn't actually live somehow, that there, um, although it had very strong links to practice, actually needed stronger links. So at that point, I was um, encouraging staff to please um, come and tell me if there were things that children were doing. So um, I could um, take photographs or if they had photographs to come and share them with me. So the photographs that are in this doc, um, pamphlet, some of them are mine, some of them are from uh, staff either at Ball Green or Hope Cottage. Um, and there are a couple have uh, sneaked in from colleagues and grandchildren. Um, but the vast majority of the photographs were taken by Ian Stewart, um, who's a professional photographer. And he was fantastic at capturing um, children's play. Um, he just had that unique skill of being unnoticed by the children, but um, having a really great eye informed by discussion um, through um, you know, the kind of things that I was looking for. Um, and also possibly practitioners pointing things out, you know, and that's a really good example there. 
and he just did it so unobtrusively. Um, and I think we caught um, a real um, flavour of the whole of um, block play across um, the two settings. Um, yeah, so I think um, I would probably now like to invite my first person to my table this morning. Um, so perhaps um, Dr. Jean Reed could um, switch on her camera and um, uh, her microphone. And um, just to start us off, um, Jean, I wondered, um, is it an espresso this morning? Yes, you would like? please, a double, please. Double espresso for yes. you. Yes, okay. uh, thank you very so much. Here we go. <laughs> So Jane, I wonder if you could maybe talk us a bit about, um, you know, what it's like to be um, the editor of all these pamphlets. Do you really want me to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a fantastic process, this, because the Trust decided to, they wanted to create resources for practitioners who had little knowledge of Froebel. And how were they going to do this? Well, it was Maurice Craft, who's still on the research subcommittee, who really pushed the idea of pamphlets, attractive, accessible pamphlets, which would introduce readers to uh, key forbidden principles together with examples of Froebel's practice at, in, at his kindergarten. But of course, in really, really important to show how Froebel's principles remain relevant for 21st century practitioners. And your pamphlet is a hugely important contribution to the series and it's you know it took a lot of work but it's a great example of how we encourage our writers to use really clear as you say concise explanatory text to introduce Froebel's ideas and his practice but then to introduce short narrative observations and photographs drawn mm -hmm. from your practice that is really important. And then, as readers will see when they look at uh, your pamphlets and hopefully will access the others in the series, they'll see that we've also got quotations from Froebel alongside quotations from current theorists and current practitioners and suggestions for further reading. So really, really important. But as you say, it is a challenge writing in this way. You have to be concise. You have to find really good uh, quotations, you have to have good observations, and you have to have excellent photographs, because photographs aren't just padding, you know, they have to support the point that you're making. Uh, and I think if you access, um, if readers, if sorry, attendees, access your pamphlet and the others, I think they'll find them a really exciting and insightful resource, which can really support uh, bringing Fabian principles into their practice. Thank you, Jane. I think it was a it was a long, um, quite a long process with me. <laughs> it took <laughs> several years to get to the point where we were, but I did appreciate the fact that you always, um, you know, you always gave constructive feedback, and you also challenged me um, to say, well, actually, that might be clear to you, but someone reading this for the first time is not necessarily going to understand. So I think. Um, it really forced me to articulate more clearly um, what I was trying to say. <laughs> yes. Well, I would say, Jane, that you are by no means alone in that experience. <laughs> you know, it, it is a challenge uh, because you have to write in a very particular kind of way. Yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe we'll um, I'll move on a little bit on the pamphlet um, and um, we can have a look at um, some of the, uh, the beginning part here. So um, I think each pamphlet has a kind of introduction with, um, you know, link to Froebel. And then, um, you know, kind of this, for my pamphlet, obviously it was the start from the gifts and um, occupations. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything. I mean, you know, you, you wrote that wonderful chapter in the beginning of Pat Gura's um, edited book, Explore and Learning, about, you know, the history of the blocks. I went back to read that quite recently. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're not saying that Froebel invented blocks. Um, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, of course, my, the point I was making in that chapter was that children have always played with something. They've always constructed with something, I should say, whether they've just constructed with 
bits and pieces of materials they find uh, lying around the house, bricks, whatever. There's something about block play that seems kind of really kind of core to children's activities. So I think, you know, from, if you like, from the dawn of time, children will have been constructing. But I think what's interesting is that what you see at the end of the 18th century is that you get educate, educators beginning to be interested in blocks. So, for example, you've got... Um, Maria Edgeworth and her father, Richard Lovell Edgeworth, they ran a school and they wrote books about their uh, practice. And they talk about using blocks for maths and algebra. But they've also got a chapter on the, you know, the kind of uh, t blocks as toys for children, uh, creative toys for children. So you've got that discussion about blocks being used in schools beginning at the end of the 18th century. And then uh, moving into the um, early 19th century, you've got infant, the infant school pioneers like David Stowe in Glasgow and Samuel Wilderspin in London uh, beginning to talk about having blocks in those schools and they're for free play. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting. And I'm wondering if I could just share a, a photo that I've got here from... Um, I'm just going to stop your screen sharing for a moment and go into mine, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, uh, it's not the right one at the moment, so I've got to move back. This one here. So this is an illustration from a book um, Samuel Wilderspin published uh, from the 1840 edition. And it quite clearly shows his playground there in London, in Spitalfields, with block play. And I've enlarged the section there for, for, for participants just to see what was going on. I think this is absolutely fascinating because Froebel, uh, Froebel's kindergarten, uh, beget, well, it was named the kindergarten in 1840, but he was developing the gifts and occupations uh, in the late 1830s. But what we see is free block play going on in the infant schools that were being opened at, at that time. Now, have, I'm going to stop my share now and go back to yours, I hope. <laughs> actually could show yours again now okay. so i think this is absolutely fascinating that blocks were really taken off as a kind of free play activity uh, in the infant schools that were developing at this time absolutely and you know i think um as part of the course where you um you know you come to work in edinburgh with us we we look a, a little bit in detail about the you know the sequence of the blocks um and today we're really going to be looking more at the um what you call the building blocks which yes. are um three to, three to six yes. so i think you know um, it, i think it's interesting to see how um you know how Froebel um, talked about those blocks and how his views of those changed about his well his pedagogy changed over time oh, absolutely. Um, yes, yes. from um, you know uh, being well through several phases of being free play um, going on you know being more prescriptive not not necessarily um, through his own volition really it was more a uh, pressure from other people wanting him to explain his blocks as far as i understand um you know and then um you know what happened after yes i, I think you're actually right there jane because i mean for Fogel, it's really important that the children were were introduced to these shapes in a kind of sequential mm -hmm. way so i know we're not looking at gift one but if you like this the sphere the is introduced to children in gift one, and then it uh, recurs in, in gift two, and then children are introduced to the, the cube, and then to the, the cylinder. And of course, the sphere and the cube are opposites, apparently, but the cylinder combines the qualities of both. Now, Fobel did want children to learn about forms and the kind of relationships between what appeared to be opposites. Um, and that was the kind of basis for then moving on through what, as you, as you say, what we call the building gifts, three, four, five and six. And, for you know, for some people today, that might seem a rather formal way of introducing children to the, uh, the gifts. Mm. Um, but what we have to remember is that 
after that, if you like, fairly formal introduction, the idea was that children played freely with them. They used them to kind of express what they were thinking and feeling about, you know, the verbal term making the inner outer. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't about rigidly telling children what to do with the gifts. They worked through them. It helped them to understand about the different shapes, the connections between the shapes, the mathematical relationships, and so on, moving from simple to complex and building up their capacities as children work through each gift in turn. So although it seems formal, in fact, at the end of the day, the children were creating freely with them. And that's really important. Yeah, and then also when you think about, um, you know, how he spoke about the forms, um, forms of daily life, forms of um, knowledge or forms of beauty, I mean, th those uh, forms could be related across any of the gifts. Absolutely, yes. You yes. know, so you would, ha you know, there's, uh, there's freedom within those forms, really, isn't there, to, um, you know, for children to explore. So, Absolutely. Uh, and actually, yes. if I just reduce this a little bit, um, you'll be able to see... Um, you know that um, you know here on the on the side here you can see a child who's um, finding that four of those little triangular prisms, um, you know, meet together to make a cube. So um, you know you can see that the knowledge um, there that that child is um, you know showing demonstrating. So. Um, yeah, I wonder if we should um, think a bit more about the pedagogy then of the blocks and, you know, what happened um, after, um, you know, after Froebel and um, well, maybe not quite to the modern day, but, you know, in the past. No, no. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. And as you were saying before, because Froebel wanted, um, wanted uh, people to understand about how the blocks might be used at a time of poverty, not many people would understand their potential. He unfortunately, well, you might say unfortunately, he produced some instructions explaining how they might be used. And then of course, what happened after Froebel died and when the gifts began to be used in infant schools in, uh, in say in, in England, uh, later in the century, you had people who didn't understand this that Froebel wanted children to be able to use these blocks creatively. So if you'd like, I'm going to share my screen again, um, just to show you some photos of what happened to Froebel's gifts when teachers who just didn't understand Froebel's principles got hold of them. So I'm going to share my screen again. So <laughs> this is... Um, these are some photographs from, taken from London infant schools uh, late in the 19th century. And what you can see very clearly illustrated in these photographs is that the teacher has made the construction. She's drawn uh, something on a blackboard. It looks like a bridge over a river. She's created uh, the shape of uh, the bridge on her table and all the children are copying it. And the observant amongst you will notice that children will have their left hand firmly behind their back. Mm -hmm. And then top right photo, you can see that is definitely Froebel's gift for being used there. Again, very clearly that the children have all copied something created by the teacher. And then in the bottom um, photo, um, this was a procedure where the teacher gave the instruction for each child to move the block. So if you look carefully, you can see that the uh, right hand is on the top of the little tower that the children have built, but they are not allowed to move from that until every child has their finger on the top of that little tower of blocks. And then she will give the next instruction to move on. So what we're seeing here is a complete misunderstanding of, of Froebel's intentions and also uh, misunderstanding from those early infant school pioneers that I mentioned, David Stone, Samuel Wilderspin, who talked about free play with the blocks. Absolutely, Absolutely. yeah. <laughs> It's fascinating, I think, to be able to, um, you know, go back to some of these documents. And I know that obviously because, um, 
you had been um, the archivist in um, Roehampton. You've got a you've had access to a lot of the documents there. But I know that you also travel around the country, <laughs> looking at um, in different libraries to find um, you know different sources. And I think the logbooks from the um, from the nurseries have been really informative as well. If I'm if I'm right thinking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes, yes. I think I think it's you know gradually you did get a development in understanding uh, about the potential blocks. I mean, what happened as you talk about in your pamphlet? You had uh, Patty uh, Smith Hill in America in the late nineteenth uh, century creating the hollow blocks, and then Caroline Pratt uh, introducing the unit blocks, which are so important. But if you like, if you if you don't mind, I'd like to share just one more photograph, and that will be it. So uh, uh, here's a photograph from if I've called it a progressive infant school in London, early in the 20th century. There you can see that a teacher has really understood the potential of block play down on the floor, blocks everywhere, uh, a, a really lovely example of just the kind of block play, many more blocks than Froebel had in his gifts, but really introducing yeah. them to children in a very positive way. Yes, yeah, so I'm just thinking actually, those, um, those aren't um, Froebel's gifts, are they? No, I don't believe they are, Jane, but no, um, no they're not. It kind of the, uh, the scale of them really as well. Um, you know, that um, they're quite small, aren't they? Um, in comparison to say the unit blocks from, um, oh, absolutely, yes, from yes. the USA, you know, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Jane. That's uh, been a very interesting conversation. Do you need a okay. top up for your coffee? <laughs> no, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to speak and thank you very much for your pamphlet, Jane. It's absolutely oh, wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. So I'm going to now uh, move on to um, looking at um, kind of practice today. So um, if I just move this up a little bit. I'll make it a little bit bigger again so you can see. Um, and I'd like to invite um, Katrina Gill to uh, join me. Um, so I'm just going to, before I ask you anything, I'm just going to say a few things. So I, myself, I've been fascinated by block play ever since I moved into nursery and found some blocks. And that were, for me was probably in um, the 90s when I moved um, into Leith Walk um, Primary School and um, to the nursery class there. And really, I didn't know anything about them very much at all until I went um, to do um, a course at Murray House, um, my diploma, uh, diploma in professional studies in early childhood education, which is where I met Sheena Johnson, um, um, who was herself a Froebel trained um, teacher uh, or lecturer. Uh, and um, it was on that course that I met Tina Bruce because she was my external examiner. Um, and I think it was probably about that time, uh, or possibly when I just moved to Ball Green Nursery, which was um, 98, that I really um, started to read um, uh, this a book, Explore and Learning, by, um, that was edited by Pat Gura. And you can see probably along the top of this that I've got several pages marked because I regularly um, return to it. So I went to do, um, later on then I went I wanted to study more about Froebel and went to um, the University of Roehampton um, with um, Lynn McNair, in fact. Um, the two of us were on the same course there at um, Roehampton. And as part of that, we had to do um, certain um, assignments. One of them was about uh, reflecting on our practice. Uh, one about was about development, a uh, development, and um, one was a larger project. So. One, the part that I did was about um, looking at a block play uh, and uh, it was uh, focused particularly on a, a little boy called Ross who was really fascinated by um, flow. He started, it was a flow in the water, flow in the sand um, and then this moved on into the blocks and he, he, um, his abiding interest was electricity. 
and he used um, the blocks in lots of different ways to represent um, batteries, pylons, generators, um, and um, really watching his um, watching his learning develop was really fascinating. Um, and um, it was pub my project was eventually published in this um, journal um, that uh, Tina edited. Um, and I, ta I talked about it as being the sense, um, the search for unity, um, because uh, at that point I was really struggling with um, Frobelian ideas and how you came to terms with a, um, you know, uh, Frobel being a Christian um, and so much of his uh, practice being based on, um, you know, a relationship with God when I myself did not have that. So for me, I was searching for this, how, how is this relevant today? Um, and how is my project relevant uh, to that? So really for me in the end, it was about that um, unity of the child's learning and the coherence that um, I could see within that through really observing and um, watching how schema developed um, and um, seeing that real sat satisfaction um, in the child um, when they, when they uh, solved a problem um, in a creative way or found something to express that um, inner idea that they, that they had um, taken from you know, their outer experience. Of, and in fact, Ross's granddad um, worked in Shetland on the electric cables and the um, things. So he had a huge, um, interest a family interest in that uh, you know in that particular topic so later on then i also um went through um looking at ob observing children and um, when we were came to write the early childhood practice global today book um i really focused on jacqueline because jacqueline had a real um rotational um rotational uh, schema and her learning was really fascinating as it went from, um, you know, being in that embodied rotation through, um, through the blocks that she, um, you know, building and um, lots of different ideas there, um, particularly uh, in uh, imaginative ideas linked to stories. Um, and right through to um, Clay and her, her own representations. So this was um, in this book that I wrote about the, um, her journey through all of the different um, stages. So I think for me, it was about that observing and finding out about, um, you know, finding out more about blocks um, through reading, through discussing with other people, either on the course or with um, Tina. Um, and I know that you, Katrina, um, also, um, you know, got a real fascination for blocks when you did the um, Froebel course um, and that you uh, you went on to do some of that in your project, too. Um, and you've gone on from there, of course, to be involved in the Froebel course, um, regularly delivering um, about block play uh, there. And since then, gone to um, Education Scotland to do some um, work for them, um, developing a resource that can be um, shared all over um, Scotland. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, your kind of journey, your um, learning through play, or in fact, practitioner, um, you know, what practitioners um, need to know most. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think I think some of what, what you're saying there rings so true, Jane, and also some of what Jane Reed was talking about when she showed us these pictures of people, um, the teachers not understanding what block play can give us. And, you know, my starting point for blocks was that they um, were in a box in the corner and we would get them out very occasionally. Um, the children would tip them all over the floor. There would be chaos. Um, the children would jump in the box and we didn't see any kind of productive learning. And that was really because we didn't understand the blocks as practitioners. So I think for me, that, that journey of understanding and when you start to understand what block play is offering children in terms of learning, then that's where that fascination really starts to, um, to come. So I think for me, that, that um, ability to share my sort of knowledge and learning over the years with other practitioners has been um, of such um, great pleasure that I've been, you know, able to do that on the course. And 
you know, you can still see it in, in history um, and recent history where people have not understood block play. Um, we were in uh, delivering the course in Orkney a couple of years ago and one of the um, people on the course came up to me and said, you know, I saved the blocks from a skip because the head of the um, school, you know, couldn't see the value in them, so I'd put them in the skip. Somebody else talked about how all the blocks had been burned because of the risk and they were too risky for children to play with. So I think this is a really um, timely time, you know, to have this pamphlet um, to help practitioners because there's a real um, resurgence, I think, in block play. People are really appreciating, um, you know, the, the richness and the learning that, that's in block play. And I know that you talk quite a lot in the pamphlet about the different sort of aspects of learning in, in block play. Um, and, you know, first of all, and you talk about the mathematical um, parts of, of block play. And I think, you know, that's probably what what people look at first of all, because obviously the blocks have this geometric um, relationship to each other. There's three dimensional shapes. Um, you have the unit block and then you have the double unit or the half unit. They all have that corresponding relationship with each other. And children are learning all sorts of mathematical um, things. Um, and I think one of the really important things about block play, it, it develops all of these kind of um, spatial skills in children that really support further learning later on, um, particularly in STEM subjects, which is, which is a really important aspect of children's learning. Um, but actually block play supports learning, you know, in, in so many other ways. Um, you know, block, blocks are probably the first time in a way that children start to kind of um, think about abstract ideas and the fact that they can construct their own um, representations of ideas. So that's symbolic learning um, that is really um, kind of inherent in blocks because they're so neutral. They don't um, tell a child what they what they are. They can be anything, um, you know, like, like your little boy making pylons with them. Um, and, you know, all of these beautiful buildings that we can see here, Jurassic World or, or children using the blocks as PlayStation controllers, that children are able to represent that um, that real life experience. Um, and, and, you know, that is really um, important for children to be able to do that because it helps them to understand. It helps them to integrate their thinking. It helps them to, to sort of tussle with the kind of questions they have um, in their lives. Um, and, and more beautiful pictures coming here. You can see, um, you know, children. Really yeah, this, was, this was an interesting one because I think this is the value of observing children at play to see what to see what develops. Um, you know, so you can see that real skill there um, in a child that spent a long time playing with blocks and understanding how they balance because there's no other way to fix them together. Um, it's got to balance. And you and you can learn actually quite um, you know quite um, sophisticated um, things about how you can balance and um, begin to stunt build if you can find the point and balance mm -hmm. and one thing. So and I think this is interesting because it's a bit like what you were talking about that um, abstract ideas from um, things. So I don't think he actually had an idea in his head what he was going to make when he started off but he you could see by the time that he got to the end there it has become a xylophone um but you know stepping back from that one of his friends came through and he saw it as being you know a tunnel so here we have you know children becoming um you know marveling at other people's ideas um, and sometimes they can get quite annoyed if it's not what they had <laughs> intended but um, you know it's about um, recognizing that other people have different points of view mm -hmm. so I think it's a really and these are huge skills for children and in their social and emotional development that, you know, th those sort of negotiated meanings that you're talking about there. And, and often what we see in, in those quite sophisticated block play, of course, is children's um, dramatic role play emerging um, from, their, from their block play. So they're creating structures that they're then using in their play. And, you know, that exactly this, you know, for, for this little boy, it's a xylophone for his friend, it's a tunnel. And so... Um, it's really um, that that takes a lot of skill. It, you have to kind of learn not to be cross about that or how you manage that, how you change and adapt your ideas. So really gives children um, a huge amount of scope for for developing that um, all, and all of those executive function skills that are, are so important. 
um, for children. I think it's lovely to see the kind of, you know, the, the, um, the development of um, block play, um, you know, starting from those very young children where it's a really, a real sensory um, experience mm -hmm. and um, may not necessarily actually build anything. It might just be actually the, you know, the sound that of the blocks as they knock together or tumble down. Um, and then, um, you know, getting to the point where they're beginning to um, stack, really, um, after, you know, transporting them all round about the place, car <laughs> carrying them. Um, and um, then, you know, actually getting to the point where um, you're maybe not just knocking down someone else's construction, <laughs> you're uh, enjoying um, and building for your for yourself. And, um, and then, of course, you know, um, the whole idea about, um, you know, that they are open ended resources mm -hmm. that you could in, you, know, you could add other um, resources. And I know that um, you and I have talked quite a lot about, you know, what is the value of having a uh, loose parts alongside? Um, do you want them there all the time? Um, you know, it depends on um, what the child's interested in, I guess. Um, and I think it was actually interesting. There was a wee question in, in the chat earlier about using um, other resources alongside blocks. I mean, I, I think in my experience, you've got to find the right balance because if you've got quite inexperienced block players, then sometimes these other resources can overtake the block play. Um, and particularly if the resources that you have are, are quite prescriptive. So if it's things like cars or, um, you know, animals, then the play can become about that and not so much about the, um, the building um aspect of it but once children have become experienced at building with blocks then these kinds of other loose parts can really develop creative ideas and you know i love how you've got the, sh the shop here with all these wonderful things um you know being sold and and again that whole idea of children um having to negotiate what something might be so although it looks like a wooden disc with a number on it actually it's representing um, something else um so it's really challenging children learning mm -hmm. i mean that the, the the number discs in that uh, photograph are actually um representing the dynamic of um the river thames because that's um that's um well it's not london bridge actually it's tower bridge i should say <laughs> with the people waiting to go across um you know uh, and and a ship coming through so the child had been they just happened to be there when um it opened which is pretty miraculous really <laughs> You know, we're talking about quite young children creating these really complex, I mean, this is a nursery child, um, really complex um, buildings. And of course, block play is not just for nursery children. You know, it, it's something that, that can go on into primary school. And I, I, you know, I know there are some schools that have blocks right up to primary seven. And I know um, when I worked in a, in a school that was attached to a primary, the older children loved coming down to play with blocks. Uh, sometimes had to be reminded they were there to play with the nursery children. So, um. so let's move on then to think about stages in block play because I know that um, you know when you are um, you know tutoring about the stages, um, you talk a lot about Harriet Johnson's stages, um, and um, you know they're quite. She defines them quite distinctly, really, mm -hmm. doesn't she? She does. Yeah. And I think I, I, for me, I, I quite like to use the stages because I think it helps practitioners understand what they're seeing. But I think it's always important to point out that, that that's just a way of looking. It's a way of observing something and that there are different ways to describe that. So in, in the Exploring Learning book, um, it, the, the progress in block play is looked at through sort of Guinella's kind of um, way of thinking about it in terms of uh, two dimensional, three dimensional buildings. So there are a lot lots of different ways to look at block play and I think when we talk about the stages it's really important to think that it's not just a linear progression um, you know that children will move back and forwards and it's like a kind of dance between the stages but it can help you see what children are, are working on and for me what's so helpful about that is that it can then help us understand the kind of support we can offer to children the kind of questions or statements we might make so you know if we're seeing a child who's stacking or creating enclosures or beginning to bridge you know that's a child who's exploring the medium they're exploring what these blocks can do and they're not necessarily building a construction specifically so for instance us asking questions like oh what have you built 
it's not helping the child. It's not helping to progress their learning in any way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it just helps practitioners to know that maybe comments like, oh, I can see how you've put all the blocks in, in a row together or you've used all the same size blocks helps give children um, ways of thinking about what they're um, doing and much better supports their learning than, mm-hmm. than some of the sort of more closed questions. So that's why I quite like the stages, but I would always kind of have that caveat with with reminding yeah, yeah, people yeah, that it's yeah. just a way of looking. Um, I think the other thing that we've uh, talked about before is, uh, you know, how important it is to um, have names for the blocks. Mm. And um, I know that we, we have um, de- debates quite often about which is the unit, you know, is is this the unit um, or is this the unit? <laughs> Is this the unit? Yeah. So, you know, actually from a Frobelian perspective, probably this is the unit because um, these can, uh, you know, can be made as parts of the unit. Oh, yeah. However, um, you know, do you want to say why you use well, the... Well, I, I always tend to go with, with that, the smaller one as the unit and purely because actually it's the same ratio as the uh, gift for um, and and actually I, I'm embarrassed to say in, in the resource that I have recorded for um, Education Scotland which is a, a four-part video series of, of kind of in-service training I, I completely wrongly said it was gift six but it's gift four and it has that one to two to four ratio and the unit block has exactly the same ratio um, I also tend to use that because that's the name that the, the sort of standard suppliers of blocks yeah. use, which okay. makes it um, more understandable for people. And, and But in, in the Exploring Learning book, of course, you're right, the, the, the very big one was used as the unit because that was the largest one and then the others were parts of that whole. And that's that Frobelian idea of unity and connectedness, yeah. which is really important, I think. Um, and, and, you know, it's re- what I think is so lovely about this pamphlet is that you've woven through all of those Frobelian principles. It was something that I wasn't able to do to the same extent with the resource I've created for Education Scotland because um, Education Scotland is a, a government, it's the civil service, so it's providing um, resources for people from all um, backgrounds. So it's really nice to be able to be specifically Frobelian about it. Um, yeah, yeah. That's good. Okay. So um, we talked, you know, it's a wonderful resource on, um, I've, I've seen it on the wakelet on um, Education Scotland's website. So, you know, congratulations on that. I think it's, it's going to support everybody so well. Um, and I think we used some of that um, resource when we were developing with um, Dr. Lynn McNair and Dr. Marlies um, Christachia, the um, the STEM block play project that we've been working on with um, a grant from Education Scotland, but with um, you know the City of Edinburgh um, standalone um, settings, um, and I think um, I don't know if you want to say anything about you know that kind of um, how we've de- how we developed that um, and what I mean. Yeah. yeah. I think it's that idea, I think, that we both really strongly believe in about um, upskilling practitioners, and that's a very Frobelian um, you know, principle as well, that having really highly trained, well-educated educators is, is so essential. So so the, an aspect for us for that training was, or that project, was about um, upskilling people and giving them that knowledge. But also, of course, there was the practitioner inquiry aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And for many of um, the participants, they had never taken part in anything like practitioner inquiry before. And you know, practitioner inquiry is such a powerful way of helping people look at their practice um, and explore um, little kind of questions that they might have. And, you know, we we had 20 settings involved in, in um, the project. Each setting had a, a manager and a practitioner, and the manager was there really to support the practitioner. And this was an opportunity for them for, for a leadership within their setting. Um, and, the, and the posters that we've have, had back have been so varied and so interesting. And you can really see where um, the different settings were at different places in their journey with blocks. So some settings had blocks split up all over the place and they didn't really have a block area and they had all sorts of different things um, kind of mixed together. Other settings were looking at much more um, specific questions. So my setting was looking at um, the role of gender and the role of girls in block play and how girls feel about block play. Um, and 
Um, I know that uh, at Cowgate we're looking at, at children's voice and, and you know what the balance was between the child's voice and the adult's voice in block place. So there was a real range of projects, and I think yeah. you know practitioner inquiry for me is such a powerful tool. I would say to everybody, you know, if you want to develop working, if you're a practitioner, then practitioner inquiry is is absolutely the way to go. Yeah, and I think. I think what was really important was having a structure for that too, you know, mm -hmm. um, so I think having that link with the university was really important, um, you know, to try and, well, to help us develop our thinking really, you know, to go beyond um, what, we, what we're doing on our everyday observing, supporting, extending, and then being able to reflect back on that, um, mm -hmm. you know, as, as um, as a staff team, perhaps, or to come out of your staff team and have to explain it to other people, um, you know, I think it's a really, um, really good skill. And finding um, finding out about some of the things that are involved, like you know, um, you know, what method are you going to use? Um, and I think we are so tuned into observing children. Um, so that um, ethnographic, um, you know, method seems to work very well for us. Um, but also within that, having to um, recognise our own um, kind of limitations or biases. And um, yeah, I think um, a really fascinating way to be able to, um, you know, develop um, thinking and um, practice. And I think it was really important, as you said, for us to have, um, you know, a pra practitioners um, and also someone who was in a management or a leadership role. So, you know, somebody who's, because that's the thing that I found that difficult as time has gone on, I have less contact with actual yeah. children and um, practice. And you're really, um, you know, I'm really was relying on um, staff um, and their expertise with um, mm -hmm. children um, and, you know, lucky to work with um, really uh, committed staff who really wanted, um, you know, to uh, develop um, children's play. So yes, um, I do you know I really forgot, I forgot that you would like a cup of tea. So I'm going to offer you a cup oh, of tea. Oh, you know I always want a cup of tea, Jane. I never turn down well, a cup I have, of tea. I have, I have, I have the small pot ready for you. Fantastic. So I'll give you a small cup of, a cup of tea. <laughs> and I will take my cup of tea and drink it gladly. Thank you. <laughs> No bother. So I think I'm going to um, move my conversation. Oh, let me just have a quick look and see. Oh, yes, this was um, this was the um, symbolic, um, you know, developing a symbolic language, and um, you know, partly looking at that observation of children with, uh, you know, and you can say, oh yes, that's enclosures, um, but actually, these two children. Um, had uh, were, were building houses, were building their, you know, their own spaces. And right in the center there, you can see uh, bunk beds and that had become, you know, a shared, um, a shared meaning for them. Um, so, and one's asking the other one, you know, uh, can I sleep in the top bunk? Um, and you can see in there that, pro that age old problem that children uh, think, how do you make um, a staircase or a ladder? Um, and actually they've done it extremely well there and um, working out how to um, you know how to construct something that is going to lead you up to that top bunk <laughs> it's just it's just so incredible I mean I think children are just so extraordinarily fascinating they really are we could talk probably for another two hours about symbolic representation <laughs> So I think at this point I'm going to um, invite um, Tina Bruce to turn her uh, mic. Thank you, thank you very much, Katrina, to turn her microphone and um, camera on. Good morning, Tina. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> would you like a cup of coffee? I would love a cup of tea if that's oh, all right. Tea. You'd like tea? Yes, okay. that's fine. I can, I can do tea. <laughs> Here we go. At the at the at the at the computer, <laughs> there, there we are. Cup of tea for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's lovely. Thank you. So I guess um, we've come to the part where we're thinking about um, 
you know, supporting practitioners. And well, obviously, you know, I um, owe a great de debt to you because over the years you have supported me through um, several placements, through several um, challenges, um, which has been, you know, you've always been a fantastic friend and mentor um, to me. But looking back, you know, really it was, it started off with that real interest in practice and that the, you know, your phrase of observe, support, extend. And to me, that is the basis of all that we do, um, and whether it's in block play or any other kind of play. So I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the um, research project where, you know, you led the research project in block play that um, Pat Gura um, edited the book for. Lovely. Well, what I would just like to say, first of all, is that I owe you a great debt because one of the things that's always been important in Fribilian uh, practice has been handing on the baton and creating Fribilian networks where people can communicate together and take things forward. And I know that you're a very key person in that and there are others in the Fribilian network. Um, who, you know, just seeing the way you and Katrina are able to have that conversation is lovely. And then I've noticed, you know, people from the Edinburgh network are, are all um, entering the chat room with, with, with thoughts. So that's that means everything to me because as we get older, and I owe a huge debt to Chris Affey, who introduced me to early childhood education and a Frobelian stance. So that that's important. Um, Yes, I mean, it was very interesting how the um, collaborative research project Interblock Play came about because at that time, um, uh, Dr. Martin Shipman was the Dean of the uh, School of Education at Roehampton University. And I was director of the Center for Early Childhood Studies. And he um, said to me, you know, I, I, I want to have a research project that is um, for Belian. So write something and pop it into me on Monday. So I thought, well, <laughs> I wanted something that was going to be very, very practical. Um, and I wanted it very much to be collaborative, participative research, as we used to, to call it then. And to put together a, a proposal around block play. Now, I was a little bit actually in, in the situation that Katrina and you have described. I, I felt I needed to know a great deal more about it. I'd always had blocks in my classroom. Um, I, I'd worked in the research school, I'd had sets of blocks, but I kind of knew that I never really got as much out of them as I felt ought to be possible because they were a very expensive item. So, um, that felt um, something that would be fascinating to explore with a group of practitioners. We were so fortunate that Pat Gura, we were able to appoint as research assistant. And some of you may know that Pat recently died. Um, she did wonderful work with the Block Play Project. And um, I, I, it would be lovely if she knew that we were celebrating that work here today. Um, it was so important that she gathered together the things we've been learning into the book. So I, I want to appreciate Pat's contribution very deeply. Um, one of the things that um, felt important was to invite schools that were local to um, Roehampton in doing this, because particularly if you live in a big city like London, it's really difficult for people to get to meetings and they're busy practitioners, you don't want to add pressure. So that felt important. Um, we wanted to explore things in an organic way. Now, what was rather fascinating when Pat and I met the practitioners, and I'm, I'm gonna just read you now a little bit from from, um, from the book. At the early meetings of the collaborative group, it became apparent that the participants 
had an expectation that the research director would explain what they needed to do and the research assistant would visit them in the schools and help them put this into action. They were clearly puzzled and a little unnerved when at the first meeting they were asked to help formulate what would be studied. They were polite, but if the truth be told, probably shared the experiences of those participating in the Ford teaching project, they grumbled about the apparent lack of guidance from the central team. So um, that, that felt very important um, in terms of how we were going to do this research. And I think undertaking that research project has convinced me very, very deeply that it's very important that researchers respect and give status to the practitioners with whom they're working. Colin Fletcher did a lot of work on this. He was a researcher who I worked with a, a bit later on, but he felt that there needed to be an equal status between researchers and practitioners taking forward work together. So that's how we worked. And Pat um, uh, made visits, first of all, to each setting. We had five schools. They were all schools. That was what the funding had been given for. And at that time, um, there were very few day nurseries, um, uh, particularly in, in the area that we were working. Um, we found that none of the five schools had a complete set of blocks. So that was interesting. And they all had peculiar mixtures of blocks. So what Katrina was saying about the relationships that were so important mathematically between the blocks was a, a nothing. So we managed to get blocks on loan. Um, um, and then in fact, people spent time um, saving up to buy the blocks. I noticed that um, Carol Block from South Africa has put a comment in the chat room. The cost of the blocks is problematic, particularly if you're working in um, communities where there isn't much funding, uh, townships in South Africa being an example. Um, if there were two things I was ever going to save up for as a result of doing this research, it would be books in the home languages of children and wooden blocks. So that I'd put all my money on those two and everything else you can find. Um, and um, so we did get the blocks on loan and actually I think all the settings bought their blocks at the end. Um, we used observation to start with as developing our baseline. We didn't change anything. We just looked at what was going on and we decided as a group, we were going to have a no blame culture. We were going to make mistakes. We were going to get things wrong and we were going to talk about it and move forward together. That's so important, especially if you're not very experienced. And it's hugely uh, important if you are, because, you know, all these phases like losing face and you have to be honest and transparent in the way you look at things together. Jane has this lovely phrase about being strawberry runners, you know, where you, you sort of take things forward together and it's quite messy. We called it organic because that sounds that sounds better. Um, and then once we'd got our baseline, we were able to make some interventions and we realised that record keeping was going to be a huge issue. Now, um, when record keeping becomes something that feels deeply important and fascinating, Katrina, you talked about fascinating children, and you can see from the way Jane talks about what the children are doing um, as the pamphlet developed, then a term like record keeping means nothing. It just becomes a huge pleasure. And of course, at that time, it was more expensive to take photographs. Well, now we can take wonderful photos. We can take little bits of video. That is not the pressure that it was. And people found lovely ways of making notes. And <laughs> it's a wonderful example of Pat sitting in the corner, trying to do a drawing um, 
of one of the, the block cake uh, constructions that children made. And this little girl had built herself a sort of tower with blocks, was sitting on top of the tower, and she just looked down at uh, Pat's drawing and she said, um, you'd be better if you came over here, you get a better picture. And so Pat moved across the room and took, took a picture at a different angle. You know, wonderful things like that, where it's not just even you and the practitioners taking part in the research, but the children also. And so we started to provide clipboards and paper, and we found children making sketches of what they've done. As Katrina was talking about the spatial relationships, finding out, sorry, it's my doorbell, um, <laughs> finding out that... Um, the, um, the, the, the way something looks at this angle, looks different at that angle, wonderful for spatial concepts, absolutely fantastic. Um, and we were having uh, fascinating meetings, reflecting on these things together. Now, something that I've, I've heard Sasha Powell say, I think it's on one of the webinars that we did um, previously, uh, she talked about the importance of if practitioners are going to be equal status with researchers, they do need to do a bit of reading because we need to do reading. I noticed somebody in the chat room was talking about another piece of research they knew about. We need that toing and froing of everybody discussing reading things together because it, observation is powerful, but you can see, are we going to call the unit the small bit or the large bit? I'm so glad that Probillions start with the whole, but then if you're dealing with um, people coming from a different direction in curriculum, you need to be able to have that conversation so we can have different lenses to look through. This is very, very important. And also, I think looking at the history, see, when you hear Jane Reed talk, it is absolutely fascinating. And there are recurring themes. There are, you know, are you going to let the children experiment with the blocks first? Are you going to teach them and then they're allowed to be creative or you can tell I'm a probelian so I know where I stand on that um, but you know wonderful conversations that you can have and look at what other people are doing so the archive is important the history is important as well as current research and literature and um so, Tina, do you think that there's a yeah. place then for you know the great the gifts now because obviously we're we're very much more used to having the um, blocks in the in nursery now, and it's not so many people have, you know, the actual gifts, so the small the small boxes. Yes. What do you think about um, using the actual gifts? Well, um, I think this is going to be fascinating. Um, the um, I was going to talk about this later, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it in now. Um, the Frerbal Trust has been making some lovely links with the uh, Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood and um, a set of um, uh, large gift three mm. um, is currently on loan to Christchurch uh, Primary School in Brick Lane in London because with Covid obviously you can't have some of the things that you would have in the museum and the museum is being refurbished. So it's lovely that um, the, the, the museum didn't want these blocks to be sitting in a cupboard until it was possible to use them again. So currently a group of children in year two are using the blocks as they um, the, the, the original gifts, they've got a set of gifts, yeah. um, small gifts. And so that's going to be very, very interesting because um, my experience to date is that four-year-olds will, will spend a long time with, with the blocks, um, but, um, and, and, and the sort of four to six sevens get a tremendous amount out of them. But for the younger children, it, it, it feels, from the experiences I've had and the research that we've undertaken, that the, the unit blocks, the larger blocks, seem to work better for them. So I think it's it's mm -hmm. it's nice to have it all, actually. I want everything. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and um, the terminology, you know, is, is important around that because whichever group of children you're working with, whatever, I think they need a consistency in the 
in the terminology. We got in such a muddle with the terminology with the research that we invited the maths department to join us because we didn't want to use words like floor and, um, you know, um, it just was very difficult. And that what, what the maths department suggested was that we made our own terminology that was consistent and then uh, the children could could uh, learn that. Um, so, yes, I mean, th this is what was powerful about the way we were researching. The practitioners had huge control over the way the research language developed mm -hmm. and they had huge control over the kind of issues that we needed to explore in order for this to be useful in practice. And I think we were all very concerned um, with, with the practice. Yeah. Okay. Did you want me to say something about reconnecting with Fred? Yeah, I was just wondering about, you know, the kind of reconnecting, um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, yes, please. That would be great. Yes, because um, at the time when we were doing this research, um, I had certainly been very influenced by my verbal training, which I now realize was very much in the revisionist tradition, which means that I was I was working from Frobelian principles, um, the power of observation, all sorts of things, but not using the Frobelian terminology. So this links on with the terminology you use is actually very important. Because at that time, um, it would have been seen as arcane, obsolete, and you would be regarded as someone who um, was stuck mm. in a time warp. Um, publishers would not publish anything that was overtly primarily Frobelian. So I was being quite generalist in the way that we went into this uh, piece of research and we didn't really use the gifts very much um, mm. at all but what has been so exciting for me now because um, that was 1990s what's been so exciting for me now is the way that the Frobel Trust um, and all these Frobel strawberry runners everywhere are reconnecting with Frobel and I've, I found myself writing about this quite a lot recently um, and um, one of the pamphlets is very helpful in reconnecting with the actual Fabelian terminology. Helen Tovey has done a lovely um, pamphlet uh, on Froebel's principles. Yeah. And so things like freedom with guidance, you know, how are you going to offer the blocks to the children, which we talked about in the block playbook and are still completely relevant Mm -hmm. I love being able now to put a Frobelian label onto it, to actually describe it in Frobelian terminology and to know that there are lots of people out there who are going to understand what we mean as Frobelian. So I feel we're, we're gaining a lot of momentum, um, you know, engaging with nature is another, well, do the children know what trees those blocks come from, and how they started out, those sort of journeys. We can actually go deeper into this if we have the Frobelian principles. So fantastic that Helen Tovey has put this into Frobelian language. It doesn't undermine what went before in any way, but it helps us to clarify um, what we're doing and to move forward. So um, we need more than principles if we're going to be good yeah. practitioners. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, um, you know, just this, the last part here um, is maybe a bit more about community and parents and family and cultural spaces, really. Um, so one of the things that I was really happy and proud to do was to work with the National Galleries in Edinburgh um, to develop We Builders, um, where we had um, sessions where parents and children could come to the gallery and actually being seen in that space, um, you know, and actually <laughs> encroaching on um, other, pe other people in the gallery, um, which um, was, was an interesting experience for some of them, I think, to um, have all these young children with all these blocks all over the um, all over the floor. 
But, you know, I think it's really important. I think Froebel really um, saw that as children being part of um, families and communities and culture and ecology. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a, a real way for children to connect with um, public spaces. And I know that um, some of the work that you were doing with um, the V&A um, was a bit like that, wasn't it? The uh, Museum of um, Childhood. Yeah. Yes, I mean, that's a journey that we're on with the museum yeah. um, and, um, you know, making the links with this school. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be a watch this space for later because we're at the beginning of that journey. But it's, it's lovely to have journeys with museums. And of course, the, the, the museum, uh, the Bethnal Green part of the, the V&A, which is specifically about childhood, started in that area of London because they were concerned that families would have um, interesting spaces where they could go and do exciting things with their, with their children. So they also are trying to reconnect with their roots um, in the way that they take this forward. And I know that the um, Global Trust, um, Sasha, is, is, is very supportive, Sasha Pearl, um, that uh, you know, we start to look at how we can have lovely workshops with with block play um, and things into the future. Indeed, the whole of the occupations. <laughs> Let's be ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, I always think if you don't have a dream, you see. Now this is where lovely for a Margaret Macmillan has always influenced me because this is how we got our workplace nursery at the university originally. Margaret Macmillan, I think, asked for um, a bath in every primary school. Um, in, in Bradford and she actually got 60 or something like that. Uh, Jane Reed will probably correct me on this, but she got <laughs> a phenomenal number of baths. And you know, to me, and that's how we got the workplace nursery because I went and looked at a house in Roehampton Lane and it cost what was a huge amount of money in those days. And so they suddenly found they could convert stables and that's where we were. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we've nearly dream on, Jane. Dream on. <laughs> yeah, we've nearly each re reached the end of the pamphlet. So this is a summary at the end, and then um, it has some references for books for children, um, for suppliers of blocks and gifts, um, and some references. Um, and um, you know, uh, yeah, a, a lots of lots of thanks um, to all the um, children in uh, Ball Green and Hope Cottage and the staff. Um, to Jane Reid um, and to um, the photo uh, credits. And um, the other thing that I should say for students is uh, the date of this publication is actually on the spine. So if you're looking for, um, you know, if you're doing a reference, um, it's actually down the spine here, the, the thing, and we, actually, and we do now have page numbers on too. So thank you to all my guests. Um, I would like now to open up to um, questions and I think Katrina has been looking at the um, chat so maybe she would like to pop on her mic and um, her camera and maybe um, read us some of the questions. I'm not sure there are any sort of outstanding ones, Jane. There's been some really, <laughs> there's been a really interesting sort of discussion going on as people have been talking. There's been uh, quite a bit of discussion about risk and yes. um, risk in block place. So I don't know whether you know yeah. you've got a bit in that. Yeah, we didn't talk, I didn't talk too much about the risk actually, um, but that, um, you know, when we were in this discussion, but here, yes, we were talking about, um, I, I think I put it in the context of supporting and extending children's interests and, you know, having that opportunity to um, build a height and, um, you know, that uh, intervention of knowing when, um, you know, when to um, need to stand back or, you know, when to be need to be there to um, help out. So, um, yes, I mean, huge and everybody has different uh, risk tolerances, um, which, you know, I think mine was um, my risk tolerance was surpassed when I saw your film. <laughs> <laughs> on the website I thought right okay that's that's beyond my uh, risk <laughs> I, I have a real um 
oh, dislike for, for a thing which is quite common, which is, you know, children can only build to a certain height. Mm -hmm. And I think because, because each child is so different, you know, I, I've worked with children who probably wouldn't be safe if the blocks were only, you know, three blocks high and some children who can get up on ladders and, and build um, really high structures and are learning so much about safety and exploring risk and that's again a, a real Frobelian thing that if we don't give children those opportunities then they never develop the um, skill or the ability and actually can be much more of a risk to themselves because they've not had that um, opportunity to practice. Um, one thing that I don't know whether whether Tina spotted, but we have had somebody in the conversation who was the parent of one of the children who was in the block play project. Oh um, wow! <laughs> which has been lovely. We've been hearing some little comments. I, I think it's is it Chris? I'm sorry, my all the questions have disappeared under a deluge of. Um, yeah, it was Chris Gomez. Yeah. Chris Oh, <laughs> that's lovely. Well, isn't that lovely? Because, you know, um, things that happen to children, you, you always wonder how it's gone on in the rest of the things they've done. That's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there was a question um, earlier on about, um, you kind of addressed it a little bit, Tina, around cultural um differences in culture and the cost of blocks and how can we access blocks um, and there was a question about you know is there some kind of guidance on the, the kind of size that blocks should be if communities were wanting to make their own sets of blocks um, I don't know if there is but they all they do have a ratio and a, a relationship to each other yes I mean what what we did um, when I worked with uh, the British schools in um, Egypt a, a while back, um, they wanted to make their own blocks. And so they were very influenced by the unit blocks. We, 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 um, we had a discussion with community playthings about it, actually, and it was, it was just going to be so expensive. And so a local carpenter did um, make, I mean, they weren't as beautifully finished and all the things that community playthings blocks would be but they were they were the right sort of mathematical relationships mm. and um were, were very useful um it, it it is it is difficult there are there, there are blocks but the probably the cost is is a big stumbler mm -hmm. um in fact the edinburgh thrubble network um helped us to buy blocks for the, the school we worked in in uh, Soweto and that now has blocks in every classroom but we we bought mini blocks because they had the same mathematical relationships but we could actually carry those out in our luggage but it, it is problematic Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a question from um, Caroline Lindsay about um, they, they introduced blocks that have been made by a local gardener and some of them with with wood bark um, and also with loose parts. And does that fit with Frobel philosophies? And and I think it's, it's trying to work out what what those are. They, they might perhaps be more classed as, as loose parts because with the bark, they might not have that mathematical relationship. And I think probably in terms of how I would certainly think about Frobelian block play, that that inherent unity and connection of the blocks being part of a system. And so the blocks that, that we use, the unit, the large unit blocks, the mini blocks, the large hollow blocks, and the mini hollow blocks all have exactly the same uh, mathematical relationship. So they can all be used together as a system. But that doesn't mean that other blocks are not um, valuable and, and useful for children to construct things with. So it's, you know, there's space for, for both things, I think. But, you know, I think you want to think about that inherent um, geometric and mathematical relationship in the blocks. Mm -hmm. the, the messages are coming in thick and fast and I'm finding it quite hard to keep up with some yes. of them. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone else has spotted any um, that I've missed, then please do speak up. Um, Lots of lovely comments from people. And, and what seems really great is that there's lots of people using these in practice who are talking about experiences that they've had, um, talking about getting parents on board and understanding how important they are. Um, 
I mean, over the years, we've had lots of um, different uh, projects within the approval certificate course, um, you know, and many posters um, that um, students have produced and then um, had available in their settings. So we know that all over um, the central belt of Scotland, um, up in um, right up into Orkney, um, into um, Aberdeenshire, round about Inverness, all of these people who have attended um, the course have, um, some of them have got taken block play forward. So we know that across Scotland, we've got um, a real uh, rich interest and resource um, there. When's so. flagging me one from 11.21, Maria. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really tricky to find them. Oh. So Maria asks, I wonder how accessible Froebel's terminology is today. Is it very much of its time and does it need modifying? Is it heavily influenced by his religious background or is it more universal? Well, so, yes, I, 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 I've, I did respond to that. I mean, I think it's useful to look at Irene Lilly's book because that does present Froebel's writing in a very accessible way. I think trying to read, say, The Education of Man is tricky. And I think, yes, it is true, as Jane, uh, Jane said herself, that, you know, Froebel was a religious man and his religious ideas underpin his educational ideas. Uh, but I think essentially what he's saying and pre uh, presenting in his work is universal. And I think that's an important point to take. Mm -hmm. I also don't come from a kind of strongly religious uh, perspective when I read Froebel, but it doesn't put me off at all. I think it's felt so powerful. And I certainly think the forms of, um, you know, daily life, um, beauty and knowledge are can be transferred across um, anybody's experiences, really. You know, all of those things are um, universal and how we um, can uh, represent those things with, with um, blocks or indeed the occupations. Um, yeah. So I think I'm going to have to um, draw us to a close today. Um, it has been a real pleasure to be round the table with um, the three of you. And I really hope that very soon we might actually be able to be at the same table <laughs> um, uh, to uh, share further discussions. Um, so thank you each of you for your contributions this morning. Um, that's it's really been a, a wonderful conversation for me. Um, I'd like to thank the Frobo Trust for inviting me to uh, write the, um, the uh, pamphlet. And I'd also like to thank, you know, the, um, the staffs in Ball Green and Hope Cottage. And of course, the Edinburgh Frobel Network. Um, so Lynn McNair, Maureen Baker, Chris McCormack and Stella Brown, who have been a tremendous um, support.